Good evening, everyone. My name is KJ Kearney, and I want to welcome everyone to I Can't Breathe, the virtual panel discussion brought to you by Goodstock Consulting. Goodstock is a consulting group that is managed by Ebony Hilton, MD, who's the medical director, Kelly McKenzie, the managing director, and Dr. Kimberly Butler Willis, another managing director. Uh, the women of Goodstock launched their consulting firm in June of 2018 to empower leaders from various sectors. Uh, to, to more effectively engage underserved communities and to drive a sustained change that leads to improve health outcomes for black and brown people. For those of you who do not know me, my name is KJ Kearney and I'm a community organizer and a journalist who lives here in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm gonna be moderating today's discussion. And I'm joined today by a panel of men from diverse backgrounds who will be introducing themselves very shortly. Now this evening, we're gonna explore how both past and recent incidents that resulted in the lives of black men and women being taken unjustly at the hand of the police have led us to this current point of civic unrest in our nation. We'll also discuss how systematic racism in the United States contributes to the pain, anger, and hopelessness experienced by many black Americans. And we'll also discuss what this moment signals in terms of how this nation can and should be functioning moving forward. So again, I want to thank everyone who is watching. Thank you for turning in. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit your questions that you want the panelists to answer on Facebook at Good Salt Consulting or via Twitter at Good Stock Rising. Also, please make sure to subscribe to the Good Stock Consulting YouTube and Facebook pages to help them track how many new folks are tracking us today. So just so you know what's about to happen, we're going to engage in discussion for about 40, 45 minutes. And then the ladies of Good Stock will be joining us to share some of the questions that have been submitted online. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to dive into our introduction. Each gentleman is going to tell a little bit about each other, uh, about themselves for about 60 to 90 seconds. And then we're going to go straight into the meat of the discussion. So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Anton. Go ahead, Mr. Anton. Okay, my name is Anton Giss. I'm from Spumberg, South Carolina. Um, I'm a school counselor, um, a coach, football coach, and also um, I'm a mentor. Uh, but most importantly, I'm a, I'm a dad. Um, so, Thank you for joining it. us today. Uh, Mr. Parks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Parks. I am from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, by trade, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I work as a manager of the foster care and in-home family services for a large jurisdiction in the greater Washington metropolitan area. And I'm glad to be here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Trey, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Trey Willis. Uh, we currently reside here in Charleston, South Carolina. I grew up in a small rural town of Ridgeland, South Carolina, uh, down near Savannah Hilton Head area. Uh, grew up very poor, uh, went on to pursue a degree in engineering at the University of South Carolina and um, currently uh, run a construction company. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Johnson, please introduce yourself. Hey guys, how we doing? Uh, Good evening, great to uh, be on the panel today. My, my name is Jonathan Johnson, originally from Denver, Colorado. I am a physician out here in the DC area. I have two practices, one focuses on wound care, the other one focuses on uh, aesthetics and uh, just great to be on the panel today. Great to have you all gentlemen, thank you very much. And again, if you have questions, make sure you let everybody know on the Goodstock Facebook or Twitter 
and the ladies of good stock will compile those questions and hopefully our gentlemen will be able to ask those qu answer those questions at the end uh if you don't mind mr johnson we're going to start with you okay uh no this question is for everyone but we're going to start with mr johnson there's a famous quote i'm sure you all are familiar with it by james baldwin that states quote to be a negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time, end quote. Now, I want to know from y'all, starting with you, Mr. Johnson, mm -hmm. what's your perspective on that statement, and particularly in light of everything that's going on right now? Well, first of all, great question and, uh, you know, great quote by uh, James Baldwin. I mean, I don't necessarily think that I would use the descriptive term of rage, but I would definitely substitute that with concern and basically being on your toes at all times. So, you know, being a minority, specifically African-American in America, you have to fight an uphill battle. And I think the most important aspect of what you do is focusing on, number one, you have to be better just to be equal. So I would substitute the rage aspect of that quote with being better just to be equal. Fair enough, Mr. Parks, what are your thoughts on that quote? So James Baldwin quote, um, really in the context of being an African-American man, standing on the forefathers that came before me, um, who landed on the shores of, the, of America uh, 401 years ago in 1619 on the shores of Virginia. And since then, we as African-Americans, African-American men's African-American family have suffered disparate treatment in every aspect of American life. However, we've been able to grit through, be successful, achieve outcomes that could never be achieved in this disparate environment, in this society in which we live. So that statement by Mr. Baldwin really speaks to, if we take a step back and look at our existence in the Americas, which is our country, not only it is our country, many of us, all of us by birth, but all of us by right and heritage because we help build this country, the wealth that exists here. So really it is the disparities and the disparate treatment that we received for 401 years and continue to receive in many aspects, healthcare, economic, education, but we made it and we will continue to make it. So I think we can be enraged, but we've proven to be successful and turn that rage into things that are beneficial to us and our families. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Trey, James Baldwin, to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage. How do you feel about that statement? Uh, living here in Charleston, we've had to endure the Emmanuel Nine. We've had to endure Walter Scott. Those two incidents really hit home for me because they're here locally, you know, really down the street from where we live at. And now we have George Floyd. And I would have to agree with Dr. Johnson when he say, say you have to be on your toes. You, got, um, you definitely have to be concerned. But man, the past few weeks, I've been feeling rage. That, that is the emotion that I've, I've actually been feeling um, from trying to figure out, because I'm also a father as well of a young son. He just turned nine. And he's going to, have to go through this stuff one day if we don't figure out an answer to these these problems that we're having. And we're going to round it out with you, Anton. I guess for me, I'm, I'm on the same page with uh, Dr. Johnson and Trey. But the one word that comes to mind with me when, when thinking about that quote um, and, and thinking about my lifespan and being a black man, um, it causes me to be suspicious and to have a lack of trust. Uh, and, and, and just up until recently, uh, there is some, some, some rage uh, in me as well. But up until now, it's, it's caused, you know, a lack of trust uh, with society and, and just seeing how things have played out in the past, you know, and so I, I, I question things, you know, like, yeah, we're rallying now and, and, and um, we're speaking up, but, is it going to come to fruition or, or, or are we going to stop just here or, or uh, we've seen it play out time and time again that, you know, people who commit these crimes, they're not convicted, you know, uh, they've received no punishment for what they do and they're not held accountable. So um, 
I'm very um, suspicious and, 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 and I'm, I'm not sure if, if the trust is there, but I, I do like what I'm seeing with, you know, um, people coming together. Um, so that does bring some hope. Now, speaking of distrust, I'm going to do an informal poll right here, and I'm going to include myself in it. How many of us, how many of the men on this panel have ever been pulled over by the police? Okay. Now, how many of us have been pulled over, let's say, more than three times? Oh, okay. All right. And do any of us have family members who are incarcerated for any reason? I do. All right, so that's three out of the five of us. And last, has any of our family members been affected by COVID? That's good. That's good. So we do have interactions with the police. Fortunately, we've been spared from COVID, at least this immediate group. But we do have interactions with the police. And some of us have family members that have had very negative interactions and are now incarcerated. And I want to know, we're going to start with you, uh, Mr. Parks. I want to know, based on the hands what were raised and what questions we raised our hands about. Uh, what does that tell you about how systematic racism plays out in America? Do you, can you make any generalizations based on the experiences that we all have, the shared experiences that we just, we just showed? Yeah, I, I don't like making generalizations. I like to be specific because, you know, our history is replete with experiences in which we, Words haven't been able to put definitively on what happens with African Americans in our society and our system. And the word is specifically defined as systematic racism. I mean, I think you look back and the history has been replete with experiences where there's been unjust treatment. Um, this is not the first lynching of a black man um, that was caught on camera. I mean, you look at older pictures and photographs of white mobs that were literally turning out in droves in order to experience a lynching of a black man. So there was over direct racism that people experienced in the forms of being called names, not being allowed to do things, being hung, um, being dragged to their death. But then the system we live in has continually perpetuated systematic racism from the point of in many urban and all really many urban and urban communities, the concept of redlining. You know, when redlining started, redlining was a direct and has made a direct implication on if you see some of the urban cities like Baltimore, I live in, New Jersey, you go into certain parts of those communities, and the community is just devastated to this day because of the concept of redlining, because people weren't allowed to get loans for banks from banks in order to buy homes. The insurance companies uh, high, charge higher rates as far as insurance is concerned. So what happened was black people, African Americans had a challenge of being able to purchase homes in certain communities. And they literally drew red lines around those communities and said those communities were unworthy. And what happened with them, and I'll finish this real quick, what happened when they drew those lines around those communities and did not allow people to be able to purchase homes, it became an implication on the school system. Because the only way you pay for school is by property taxes. If you don't have people paying property taxes, you don't pay for school. So you have inferior schools as a result of redlining. So those type of unsaid, unwritten, systematic racist approaches have really impacted us in many communities to this day. Um, so I think systematic racism is really, you can't see it. There's no one individual responsible for it, but it's prevalent and it's all around. And it's the way that the police have continually policed the black community mm -hmm. is because the systematic racism and the implicit bias in which they approach our communities. And for those of you who are watching, uh, Mr. Parks, to your point, there's a really good book called The Color of Law that does a great job of explaining redlining for anybody who wants to get uh, a little bit more information on what Mr. Parks said. I want to I want to divvy off from that question because you you brought up some good points. Um, let's start with you, Anton. Systematic racism, uh, Mr. Park said, is are things that we can't see, but there's some implicit biases, some racism, some prejudices that have negative effects on us. In your job, tell people what you do and, and tell us how systematic racism plays out in the work that you do. I guess for me in my profession and 
being a school counselor and I, I, I primarily deal with high school students. Uh, so you see it and, um, and I've also been a middle school counselor as well. So when they're being placed in classes, um, the schools that they attend from elementary school to middle school, uh, they're placed um, in, in, in the classrooms with their peers from their same neighborhoods who, who may ne not necessarily have the, the financial support at home that others may have from a well-to-do family. So um, those well-to-do families, they're able to, to support the school a little more and provide more instruction materials as well as field trips, you know, for those students to get out and to be exposed to different things. So when they get to high school, that gap, you know, increases a little more. And so the courses that they're placed in are, are, are not the same courses on, on the same level. So you may have a student um, in, a, in a college prep level class, you may have a student in the honors level class, and you may have a student in the AP class. But it starts, what, what a lot of people don't know is, it starts in the elementary school, you know, when they're tested and they're exposed to different things, you know, um, and even before they go to school, go to public school, like three, um, 4K. Uh, a lot of our families in these little economic neighborhoods, they don't have uh, those funds, you know, to put their kids through those type things. So uh, that's the type of system, um, systematic racism that, that, that I see in the school system. And Dr. Johnson, let's go to the health field. I mean, you have two practices, how does systematic racism and implicit bias show up in the work that you do? How do, how do you recognize it? How does it manifest rather itself in your work? So great points by everybody that, were, that was on the panel. So systematic racism will always be there. And unfortunately that is the truth. Not only do we have systematic racism, we also have financial racism. We have literacy, uh, literacy racism, there is always going to be oppressed uh, thought processes from those that think they are better than someone else. And every day when I wake up, my thought process is the person that is oppressing you is insecure. They don't have the same type of mental capability to deal with what you deal with, to, to be on your level. So I, that's what I think about all the time trying to excel as far as you can in your specific field, whatever that may be, and then you give back, and then you reach down, and then you try to bring the next brother, the next sister up as much as you can. So as far as healthcare is concerned, it's rampant. I mean, we've seen it with a lot of the COVID issues. We've seen it just with healthcare disparities in general, but the most important aspect of healthcare as far as what we can do is to focus on going as far as we can. You know, you're not in our lifetime. I, you know, I wish that it would be different, but I don't think we're gonna change that in our lifetime. I hope that we can maybe make adjustments and maybe make people realize the issues that we go through. But I think if we focus on working as far as we can go in our specific fields and give back as much as we can, that's what we can do. And I think that's the best thing we can do. Um, Trey, I'm going to start with you, but I want any of the other panelists to chime in. Dr. Johnson, you said something that made my ears perk up. You said that uh, systematic racism, at least in our lifetime, is never going to go away. Um, that would bring up the question, then, why are we doing this? Why are we asked? Why are we marching? Why are we protesting? Why are we running for office? Why do those things if 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 systematic racism is going to continuously be there. I want to start with Trey. And if anybody wants to jump in on that question, including yourself, Dr. Johnson, I, I would love to hear a, a quick rebuttal after Trey uh, gives his answer. No problem. Um, I actually think um, there's some merit to what Dr. Johnson is saying. You cannot pass laws that change people's heart. You just can't do it. But I think we can change laws when we know there are laws like red line, like uh, Mr. Parks was talking about. When we know we have laws on there that already give people of minority a disadvantage, those laws we can change. Now, as far as somebody out here treating someone bad, that's, that's not a, a public figure 
or that's not a government employee in the private sector, you can't legislate that. I come from the private sector. Um, I've experienced racism um, firsthand at, at a previous employer of mine where, where a guy flat out said, I'm not, I'm not willing to work with this guy. And, and he, he quit and got fired. So you're not gonna be able to pass laws that change people's hearts. But I do think we can, we can protest when we know there are, when, when we know black men are being killed by police officers at a very high rate, th- we can do something about that. Uh, Anton, Mr. Parks, either one of y'all wanna, wanna get in on this? I, I do, um, and it's it's funny how the universe works because I was talking with with one of my former players, um, a former student, and he said the exact thing. He was like, "Coach, um, I don't think you know uh, it's going to make a difference because racism is always going to exist." Because you say the very exact same thing Trey said: you can't change somebody's heart. A law can't change somebody's heart, and this is coming from a 19 year old. Um, and and um, he said, because um, people are being raised by their families to, to feel that way. And it's just mm-hmm. in them and it's in their soul. And, and my response to him was, you're right. You know, um, we can't do away with racism, but, you know, for the p- police brutality and, and, and some of the injustices, we can play, put some uh, protest to have some laws be in place to hold people account- more accountable and um, to get some laws in place to get some convictions, you know, so when these injustices occur, you know, so that we won't just continue to march and feel like um, our, our protests are falling on deaf's ear. And so that came from a 19 year old, a 19 year old. Mr. So Parks, think, any thoughts? Yeah, so I think if, you, if, if I use a scenario of the school system, you know, I think it's really important to look at how we fund our school system. As Dr. Johnson talked about, education is the key up and out. And that is important that we ensure that our children and children's children get the opportunity to get good educations. And it really starts with early childhood education as early as possible. And that if we have a system in which all schools are funded equitably, I think somebody, one of the panelists talked about having a more wealthier school so they can take advantage of going on trips and field trips and different activities and be able to have the latest technology. But if you go to a minority, a poorer school, they don't have that because of the tax base and that's how they are funding the schools. So really looking at legislation to look at how we fund our schools and our school systems. I think we have to challenge the systems and continue to challenge the system, especially like the justice system. When you got five, for every one white male locked up, there's five men, black men that's locked up. And you really have to challenge that system. And then we have the opportunity to challenge implicit bias because implicit bias is a, is a concept that we can simply challenge somebody. I'm quite sure everybody on this panel And everybody that's watching has heard someone say, I don't see color. That's an implicit bias that we can say, yes, you may not think you see color, but that's an implicit bias because people, everybody sees color. So let me ask y'all a question then. Um, I want to, I want to push on this a little bit more. It seems that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is systematic racism is always going to be a thing so let's not worry about that and let's worry about what we can do, the things we can do. Let me let me ask you all a, a question and anyone who wants to start after I you know, present this, please feel free. Uh, most recently, we had a young lady, a white lady named Amy Cooper, who was in a park in New York City. And she's recorded telling this black man that who you know, we talk about education, right? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, he's Harvard educated, right? So we talk about educating being this great equalizer, but this brother from Harvard who graduated from Harvard still had the cops called on him. Do you think that we're putting too much emphasis on school education and, and maybe not enough emphasis on, on other forms of education that may actually like civic education, you know, learning about laws, learning about policy. Should we be shifting our focus a little bit more as we go forward? Or do we still believe that, you know, education can get us out of these, uh, some of these issues that we find ourselves in? So let me jump in on that quick question. So going back to the whole systematic racism, it's your thought process is that you know it's there, you know it exists. We need to continue to chip away at every single injustice that we see, period. We just need to understand that that's there. So, you know, that business loan that you're looking for or, you know, or or trying to work with a 
with a different group that may not accept you because of your race, et cetera, you just need to understand that now I need to play chess instead of focus on playing checkers. Now, as far as the education thing, I remember I started my orthopedic surgery residency. I'll never forget this. It was the first day and it was like the introduction where everyone was sitting in a room and we were introducing ourselves to the rest of our colleagues as well as to some of the attendings. And, you know, you, you go around, you say your name and, and uh, what field you're in. And I'll never forget, there was a sur surgeon that was from South Carolina, actually. And I said, my name is Jonathan Johnson. I'm from Mayhary Medical College. I went to Xavier University, orthopedic surgery. And he looked at me and said, your orthopedics? As if I can't be orthopedics, which is, you know, definitely a difficult specialty to get into, which, you know, you have to work hard to get into. My point goes back to what you were saying about education. Education is not going to change that type of implicit bias because it's a learned behavior. People are taught to be racist. People are taught to have this type of bias based on who they're around, based on who they associate with. Your goal and your job is to totally dispel that, so, that racism, that whole notion, that whole concept. Hey man, how you doing? Hey, let's grab something to eat and let's chat. How you been? You may be from a different you know, area from where you are from or where you are from, but you want to make sure you have that connection to totally dispel that type of issue. I'm going I'm, to I'm I'm say, Mr. Johnson, before y'all jump in, you're asking a lot. You're asking the person who is being oppressed to sympathize with their oppressor and go as so far as the, you know, go out of their way to make them comfortable to prove like, hey, not all not all black people are bad black people. Do you think that is that something that we should be spending our energy on? I'm a, Mr. Johnson, real quick, and then I want to make sure everybody else gets a chance that's, to answer. That's, that's a good point. So now I wouldn't say oppressor. I'm saying that someone who that has a different uh, perception of who you are as a person. I'm not saying someone who's calling the cops on you. Obviously, that's a whole different story. But someone who doesn't understand or someone who has some type of implicit bias that's learned needs to know that dude, I may be on your level, but I also may be better than you. Fair enough, Mr. Parks. Well, you look like you got something there to say. I want to hear it, brother. Uh, so, so I mean, I think as we continue to, to, to walk in the streets and we successfully protest, I think the message is now out. I mean, I think if you see these protests, you see a lot of white folks, young white folks, older white folks, white folks my age, um, and now it is time that hopefully their eyes are woken to the implicit biases. The reality of the first sin of America, that sin of slavery, has really continued to have um, long lasting impact in this country. You know, where I grew up, it wasn't no trust fund babies in Edmondson Village in Baltimore, Maryland. And it was only until I went to other, other educational opportunities that I began to hear about this trust fund idea. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Um, but they look at the world differently. And I think that as now we see people understanding that um, silence is complac compliance, complacency, um, that hopefully now those folks' eyes will be woke, awoke. You know, as, 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 as um, it, it was sung uh, about two years ago, the whole kind of concept of wake up and America hopefully is slowly waking up after we have been in this country for 401 years and really built this country, that those oppressors that have oppressed us now hopefully understand that this is a real issue. And this is a time hopefully we'll pivot and make a change. So it's really about that person that has the implicit biases looking at themselves critically, um, which is the challenge. So hopefully right. this won't just be a news flash and then the next sub sub issue comes along. Anton, Trey, I wanna get your thoughts on what Mr. Parks and Mr. Johnson have said. Uh, let's start with you, Trey. You've been quiet for a little bit and then we're gonna to get to, to Anton. Um, I agree with what Dr. Johnson said. Um, like you, like he said, I wouldn't say it's your oppressor, but when you're in a professional atmosphere and you're dealing with people who you know has that bias, who probably have been raised to think a certain way, then I think it's probably our job. I would probably go as far as to say it's our duty to come in every day and encounter that with something that that we know that they're thinking 
Like for instance, um, for whatever reason, at a very young age, I stopped wearing jeans. Like I didn't wear jeans probably up until about a couple of years ago. I always wear khakis, always had a nice collared shirt on with my paint, with my shirt tucked in my pants with a belt. Looked like a square. But for whatever reason, I started doing that in like the ninth grade. And by the time I got to college, I walked in at USC, I went to uh, USC Columbia, and the, the resident of the hall, the resident RA, he thought I was another RA. Simply how I dress. People say, well, you don't judge a book by a cover, but the truth of the matter is you are judged on your appearance. So if you're sitting out here with your pants hanging off your butt, people are gonna judge you and think you're ignorant and you don't know any better. Anton, you work with kids. So I wanna ask a question that kind of goes to what Trey has been saying. I also worked in public education, right? And so this idea that you can dress your way you know what I mean? If not to success, but at least to not be bothered. Is that something that you're teaching your students, the, 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 the young men and women that you're mentoring? Or what, what are your thoughts on this idea that the way you dress can kind of keep that heat off you just so you can live another day? I, I stress the importance of, of appearance. Uh, and, I, and I really used to stress it really hard. Um, but, and I've, I've, I've been in, in, this education field for 15 years. Um, so I, I used to be really big on it, but I, I'm, I'm really big on having them to, to wear their pants up above their waist. Um, but, and, and I used to prop, I want to still do, I pride myself on, on my appearance, but the longer I've been in the education field and um, my work should speak for me. Um, the work that I do and my character should speak for me. So, uh, I've kind of shifted a little bit, you know, because I know who I am. I know what I stand for and I know the kind of work that I do and I know how I treat the kids uh, in, in the school that I work in the school district and my community. I know how I treat the kids, you know, and I, and I treat them like they're my own. Um, and I, when I see them, I see the potential that they have and what they can become in the future. So, um, and, and I feel like, you know, um, I haven't um, been placed or, or, or looked upon for certain things because of the color of my skin. I coach football. It's, it's, there are not many black head coaches in the NFL. There's not many black head coaches in college. There's not many black head coaches in high school football. You know, um, don't get me wrong. There, there are a, a lot of good white coaches, but you going to tell me that it's that many more um, white head coaches that are, are that are just that more intelligent and more capable of, 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 of heading a team than a black male um, because the majority of, of, of football players are black you know yeah. that's, just a, that's just an issue all the way down not just in the NFL level it is all the way down to high mm -hmm. school you know so um, I, I've kind of changed a little bit and I said I'm gonna, I'm gonna be me regardless yeah um, because at the end of the day, they're still going to view me how they're going to view me. So I'd rather be myself than right. try to be somebody else. So, yeah. and, and I preach that to, it's, it's about the kids. So I preach to the kids. I have black males looking at me every single day. So I want them to know, okay, it's cool to wear some jeans and a t-shirt up on your butt with some Jordans on. Mm -hmm. So I let them know you can still dress, you know, and be cool and be neat at the same time and still be someone, you know, in your community that others look up to and do things the right way. So I don't necessarily, you know, tell them you, you got to wear your shirt tucked in, you got to wear a, boat, uh, uh, a button up or khakis. I did that in high school. You know, that's yeah. why I was smiling when you were talking, Trey, <laughs> you know, because, you know, uh, when we were brought up, that was the way, right. you know, but it has changed a little bit. So now, you know, when we're able to dress down on Fridays at the school, I will wear my George because I'm a, I'm a sneaker head, you know, so I let them know it's cool. You know, you still, you can, you can go to college, or you can learn a trade and you can get up and work every day and take care of your family and still be cool. You don't have to go out here and do all this other stuff, you know, and to, to get recognized and to be cool. Understood. Um, so for those of y'all who are just joining us, thank you. 
this uh, panel discussion. We're discussing uh, racism and the current state of things with these esteemed black men. Thank you for joining. And if you wouldn't mind, share this link, the live link, the YouTube link on your social media so your other friends and family can come in and see what we have going on. I'm going to shift a little bit and ask a different question. Um, during a recent press conference, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but there was a press conference in Atlanta with Mayor Keisha Bottoms, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Let me be, let me give her her full respect, give the whole name. Uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, in which Killer Mike was there. He was present. He was very emotional. You know, he stated he didn't really want to be there. He's tired of this. Um, but then he said, it is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. It is your duty not to burn your own house down with anger uh, from your enemy. Now, we've seen a lot of protests going on uh, everywhere. In Charleston, it's going on. D.C. definitely is going on. I don't know, Anton, if anything's happening in, in the upstate. But when y'all hear that phrase, I, I want to hear from y'all. I mean, because we have a right to be angry. We have a right to protest. And like Martin Luther King said, uh, the, a, a riot is a language of the unheard. So we've been gone. We've been unheard for a very long time. I want to know from y'all, when you hear that statement, do not burn down your own house for anger for your enemy. What, what comes to mind? Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Johnson. Then we'll go Mr. Parks, Anton, and then Trey. So there's an awesome book called Emotional Intelligence, man. I, I definitely recommend everybody reads this book. And, and one of my favorite chapter quotes is that you don't want to have immediate emotional gratification or give in to immediate emotional grat uh, uh, gratification to destroy the entire war, which basically means, you know, that one instance of, you know, quote unquote, mental stress relief that you get from you know, that, that anger exchange may set back what you're trying to do in the long run. And obviously we've seen the different aspects of the media and how the, the movement has been portrayed because I call it a movement. And all you can do is focus on yourself and your team and what you're doing in order to move forward, but focus on the long game. This is chess, focus on the long game. Mr. Parks. Um, so it's about accountability. I mean, I think what, what I've seen that was most powerful or heard stories of, saw on, on the different news outlets was when people were engaging in violent type behavior during the um, protests, those folks that were, were out on the street kind of stopped them and said, we weren't having this. Mm. You're not gonna do this here, you know, because we're here for a particular cause. We're not here to create violence. You know, there's always folks in any society that's gonna take advantage of an opportunity. And I think that's what you saw on that first night. And I think the language that um, Mayor um, Lance Bottoms came out with on that Friday night was powerful. And we don't see that in politics enough around accountability for self. There's no reason for people to engage in this behavior that destroys our communities. I mean, I think, and I referenced it earlier because I'm probably the oldest cat on the whole panel. Um, there are some cities you still go into that they're still reminiscent right from the riots from 68 when Martin Luther King was was killed and those cities still have not healed from that. So, so that was many, many years ago. And if we destroy what we have, what will we give to our children? And it's all about building and building wealth in this community, in this society. And that's what we got to take to heart and, and like hold that. accountability for each other. Me for right. you and you for me. Yep. I like that. Uh, Anton, what are your thoughts on that statement, sir? Um, it's something that has stuck with me. Um, I have a saying that I got from one of my coworkers and it, it, and it really means, um, or, or it's equal to, to what um, Killer Mike and, and, and Mayor um, Bottoms were saying, and it's don't let a nickel hold up a dollar. Don't let a nickel stop you from getting a dollar, you know, or, or earning a dollar. Um, meaning don't let something small get into, the, get into the, your way of accomplishing something big, you know, or, or, or don't let something minor get you in, into a whole lot of trouble. And, and that's something that I use with my students all the time. And, and a lot of them know what, what I'm saying to them because I say it often, don't let a nickel hold up a dollar when I have them in my office, you know, talking to them about the issues that they go through. And so it, it, makes, it makes no sense uh, for us 
to um, destroy, you know, properties uh, of our people, our community, you know, when we're trying to get past this and we're trying to better, better ourselves and, and, uh, and move forward. Um, I, I, I want to big up Spartanburg um, because we just had uh, a rally down here where we had um, leaders um, from all cultures come together um, this past Friday morning. Um, all, they all came together and, and, and shared a similar message of, of how, how we can improve Spartanburg and not destroying our community and coming together as one and, and, and doing things the right way. Um, so um, it was really encouraging. Um, and um, we haven't had any, any re really big issues here with um, destruction of property. So right. I, I want to commend you know, um, the people who are out protesting and our, um, some of our city leaders Okay. And Trey, wrap this up before we go to our next question. Killer Mike said, uh, it is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. What are your thoughts when you hear that statement? You on, you on, you on mute, brother. I'm sorry. On, on his face, um, he, he's absolutely correct. Um, for what do you gain by burning your own house down? What, what does that buy you? Now, I saw a video the other day where a young lady was rebutting what he, what he said. And she stated that we don't actually own anything. She said the communities that you see that are burning, that's not their community. And even in the communities they live in, they don't own nothing in those communities or very little do they own. So her thought process was, we're not losing anything by burning this community, but I argue you are you are losing something. Number one, you're you're taking the focus away of what the real issue is because mm -hmm. the only thing the naysayers want to say is, "Hey, look at them now! They're they're rioting and they're burning and looting," and that's taking away the issue was a white guy just literally had his knee on, on a guy's neck and killed him. That's taking the the that the eyes off of that issue and focusing on something that in the grand scheme of things doesn't even matter in the grand scheme of things. So Louis Farrakhan once said that, you know, you take one of mine, I'm going to get two of yours. Right. Um, and I'm not, I'm not advocating for, you know, going out here and murdering people, but what I do want to know from all of you gentlemen, you're very successful in what it is you do. You carry yourself. Well, um, you, you have a lot of respect of people, People in your community have a lot of respect for you, but at what point does respectability get in the way of progress, right? Like a lot of things we've been saying is we can't give people the wrong impression. We don't want people thinking this. We don't want people thinking that. At what point do we put respectability to the side or can we, are we given that freedom to at any point put respectability aside and literally fight for what we need to make sure that future generations don't keep going through this. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Parks. Uh, then we're going to go to Trey, Anton, and then Dr. Johnson. Yeah, I got one answer for that, and, and it's, it's simple. And it goes back to the core. Take care of your families. And take care of those that you love and those that are around you. And if you take care of your families and those that you love and the, those that are around you and extend yourself to the <clears> next <throat> person in the next village, yeah. that's your community. And that's how we will be heard. That's how we will improve our, our, our society, our gener the generations that come. If we take care of ours first and foremost, which was done throughout African-American Black people history. You know, I think we talked to some cats older than myself. They really kind of lament um, the time in which um, the civil acts right, rights changed so much of our community from what it was strong when you had Itch. Black doctors down the street, when you had Black accountants down the street. When you had the hotels, you had the restaurants. I see you wearing a black Wall Street hat. And a lot of our older, older cats, they talk about during that time, black people can have businesses. They can get businesses. And we be, we assimilated, which we wanted, which was a dream. And it was beautiful. But now what are we chasing? We chasing the dollar. We need to be chasing our families. We need to make sure that our families are taken care of. So black men have a real core responsibility. And that's take care of their family. And that's that that that, that those that have been given to us by God, in which form or fashion you believe in God, Allah, God, whatever you may, take care of them first, extend it to the next group, bring them children in your house like Anton and the football coaching, 
like Trey in his business, like Dr. Johnson in his medical practice and, and extend yourself because that's what we have. At the end of the day, all the material stuff will go away. And if we have the opportunity to change this one life, yep. that's forever. That'll, that memory lasts forever. Oh, good one. Trey, what are your thoughts on that, sir? Do you think that we have the ability as black people to put respectability away and just, you know, tooth the nail fight for what we need? No, I think at that point you break out into a civil war at that point. Cause if you bring my, if I bring my gun, some, somebody from the other side is going to bring their gun and we're going to kill each other. And what, what are we going to have when all the bloodshed is all over said and done? What do we really have? Just a lot of dead people laying on the ground. So I don't think that's the way to go about it. Um, but what uh, Mr. Parch was saying, I think that's a better way. It's uh, five pretty successful guys on here. What we have to do is, is give back to the community. We have to be active in our community, involved in our community. And we, we have to fight for these injustices, but we have to fight about it the smart way. We have to teach our kids the right way. There are kids in our community that may not have uh, a male figure in their life, but we have to extend ourselves to those people in our community and, and, and get them all together on one accord. Say, hey man, you don't have to do this. There's a better way. Let me show you. So like uh, Anton was saying, I, I coach football too and I mentor some kids as well. And you know, this here is just going to perpetuate me even more to get more involved in my community and so that we can stop some of this foolishness. Anton, I mean, that was a perfect segue to Anton. What are your thoughts, sir? My, my thoughts are um, I, I work with, you know, and I, I've been fortunate to, to have been around some, some, some good people from different cultures some good white people. Um, and so, I mean, it, it, when you're angry, of course, you may have some thoughts, but when it comes down to it, we're in, in the positions that we're in for a reason because we're mature and we're responsible. Uh, so when you think about, you know, the best practice and the best, pro the best way to probably go about it, um, it, it, it's like what Nate said, you know, um, you, 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 you dig in the trenches and what you do is you uplift and you try to empower the youth uh, because, um, is, is, a, is a quote um, when I first got into education um, that I heard um, someone say, and it says, um, you touch a rock, you touch a past, uh, you touch a flower, you touch the present, you touch a child, you touch the future. So that's why I really enjoy working with kids. Uh, I know that I can make a change mm -hmm. uh, for the betterment of this world by working with them and, and mentoring them and teaching them the right way to do things. Yeah. Um, am, am I perfect? No. Do I always give them the best advice and the best way to do things? No, but I, I, I teach them how to um, go about doing things in a responsible and a respectful way um, towards others. And, and although uh, someone may uh, mistreat you in the same token, you go and show them that you're bigger than that and, and mm -hmm. that you can still rise above, you know, whatever obstacle that they try to place uh, upon you. You know, so um, yeah, I just try to teach teach the youth. Dr. Johnson, uh, yeah. you're going to you're going to give our last answer before our very last question. I got so you. what are your thoughts on this, sir? Well, I definitely agree with everybody on the panel. Um, it's a mental game and the enemy wants you to psych yourself out so that you believe that you're not good enough to make it to the top, period. But if every day you wake up, and you take one step at a time, you accomplish what you need to accomplish, and you go as far as you can, and then you reach back and give back, that's the key. You've won. And that's what they don't want us to do as a community. That's what they don't want us to do as a people, because they, they're trying to separate the concept mentally from you that you're not as good as I am. And if you don't think like that, and if your thought process is focused on excelling yourself just like nate said your family just like anton said and just like trey said you're winning and that's the key fair enough um 
We're about to wrap it up, everybody, at least this portion of the discussion. I want to thank everyone for watching. I can't breathe. This panel discussion has been eye opening for me. I have way more questions for y'all, but I got 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go ahead and ask my last question before the ladies from Goodstock come on. And they have a series of questions to ask y'all. Uh, Trey, we're going to start with you and then we'll work it around. Um, uh, during the June, uh, there was a, an event on June 3rd uh, hosted by my forever president, President Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, and that event was titled Reimagining Policing in the Wake of Continued Police Violence. And in that event, he stated that, quote, to bring a about real change, we have to both highlight the problem and make people in power uncomfortable. But we also have to translate that into practical solutions and laws that can be implemented. So here is my final question for all of you gentlemen before the ladies of Goodstock come on. Given everything that has happened, now we don't all have to have the same answer. I hope, I hope we all have different answers because I want to I want to learn some new stuff. But Trey, I'm gonna start with you. When all this settles, when the dust settles on this particular series of events. What is a practical, tangible change that you want to see come out from all of this? What is, and that question's for everybody. What is a practical change that you want to see come out from all of this? You're on mute again, brother. My wife got me muting and unmuting. <laughs> That's all right. Let me ask you one more time. What are some practical changes that you want to see take place when the set when the dust settles on all of this going forward? One of the one of the changes I'd love to see is as a community, we get involved in our local politics. Our local politics have more control over our lives than who's sitting in the White House and who's sitting on Capitol Hill in DC. I always see us, we, you know, everybody came out to vote when Obama ran. That was all well and good. But then two years later, when, when Obama's still in office and all these local elections are happening and your mayor races are happening in your city and town, council members, are, you know, a couple of thousand people show up, if that. These people are the ones who are directly controlling who's in office, who the police chief is, what are the policies that are being implemented in the police department? So I'd really like for us that same um, enthusiasm we get when we see Barack running. We need to get that same enthusiasm at the local elections because those people are the ones who really have more control over our lives. Thank you, Trey. Anton, what are your thoughts? What are some practical things that you want to see going forward? Um, Practical things. Um, the first one is more accountability uh, um, for our elected officials and, and, and law enforcement and people in the judicial system. You know, so um, maybe something like having um, respectable um, community leaders on a board, you know, um, to um, make decisions when it comes to um, injustices, you know, um, committed. Or, uh, by um, police officers or something of that nature. So we can have a, a, a better shape when it comes to uh, going to court or something. Uh, and, then, and then like Trey said, I mean, we gotta get out and vote, man. Um, not just for the president, uh, Congress, are the, they're the ones who are writing laws and making laws, people in the house and the Senate. Uh, we don't hear our people talking about that. So getting out and, and, and voting um, you know, on, on those elections, the mayors, the sheriffs, uh, uh, people in your local community. So um, I, I, I want to see us doing a better job. And then as black men, um, empowering one another. I don't, I, I don't think enough of that is being done. Um, like when, when you make it or if you get to a position uh, or a leadership position or you're doing well for yourself, reach back and pull the next guy up and pay it forward. You know, I think we have to do more of that and, and be more willing to mentor other young young black men or black men, your peers, you know, not just somebody young. You know, you see somebody coming into your profession, mentor them, reach back and show them, you know, this, this is the role that this is the way you have to do things and I'm gonna give you a hand so you can be successful. So Trey, if I understand correctly, you said more local civic engagement 
uh, Anton, you second him, but you also said more peer to peer empowerment, right? More peer to peer empowerment with our, our, our brothers and sisters. Uh, Mr. Parks, what is some practical changes that you want to see place take place when all this settles? I do think it's legislation. I do think it's um, legislation at the level of looking at um, the, the those brothers that's coming back from being incarcerated and the, the, the impact that has occurred in our families where those brothers have been taken out of the family and women have been made to man up and raise children without two incomes, with one income, with a minimal income, with an hourly wage income, which is almost difficult to do. So I really would hope that this is a wake up call for the judicial system and the police. You know, I think that we see police symbolically nailing in the streets with other people. But if we look at it, you know, police have historically been um, oppressive of our community. So I hope we see increased cultural competency with training with our police. We hope that we see those police look to treat people fairly and with respect, with empathy and kindness. I hope they use some discretion and restraint at points in times. Um, I hope they realize that they are in communities where people can solve their own problems and they don't need to solve them. I hope they will increase their recruitment of minorities um, in order to police communities of color and really accountability. I hope that the police at the top hold those police officers on the front line accountable for their behavior, especially around misconduct. So legislation um, impact with successful policing, but for our community, the black community, accountability of, of taking care of our families and raising our children and reaching out to those next families that's next to us to improve their lives too. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Johnson, what are some practical things you want to see going forward? Definitely number one, vote. Local politics is key. Number two, just like everyone said on the panel, giving back. And I would also add, we need to increase resources and access to minority health care. We are not accessing the funds we need. We don't have the providers that we need. And we need to make sure we have the resources from a healthcare standpoint to be able to do everything that we're talking about on the panel. So that's the third aspect I would, I would add is access to better health care for minority communities. We have about four minutes left. So that means each of y'all get a minute. OK, I don't want any of the ladies from Good Stock cursing me out because I let y'all go on too long. We've done a wonderful job. And thank you again for everyone who has been watching thus far. We have a question and answer period coming up right after these gentlemen answer my last question. And that is, how can people find you if they want to connect with you? after this is over. Uh, Trey, you're in South Carolina, but you're in Charleston area. Anton, you're in Spartanburg. Parks, you're in the DMV, right? The DMV. Okay, and Mr. Johnson, where are you at? I'm in the DC area. Okay, good, good. So in case anybody watching wants to get in touch with you, uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Parks, then Anton, then Trey, then Dr. Johnson. If there's a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whichever you check, YouTube channel, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect after this is over. I'm Nathaniel Parks at Nathaniel Parks on Facebook. And I also email address npnatep at Gmail. So hopefully we can leave our information with the good stock folks and they can have access for all of our contact information. I want to thank you, KJ, for facilitating this panel. My pleasure. Anton, how can people reach you? They're going to have to go through good stock you know, to get in contact with me. I, I'm old school. I don't have any social media or anything <laughs> like that. So. Well, respect, you, respect. Huge. All right, Trey, how can people find you? Is this the same thing? You're going to be like, they got to go through good stock? No, I'm on social media. Uh, Trey Willis, I'm on Facebook. You can look me up. Um, you can also go through good stock to get in, in touch with me as well. Dr. Johnson. Definitely. KJ, great job. Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, shouts out to everybody on the panel. I'm at Dr. Wounds uh, at Instagram, Twitter, and anyone who's interested in the healthcare field, uh, you know, learning about it, seeing what it's about, please contact me. I'm happy. Uh, I'm I'm uh, happy to help you out. And Doctor Wounds is that one word or doctors yeah. under? Okay, all one yeah, word. Doctor okay. Wounds, one word, and uh, I'm in DC, Comprehensive Wound Care Services, and uh, CWSWounds.com. All right. As for me, I'm KJ Kearney. I'm heavy on Instagram. You can look me up at KJ Binya. That's K-J-B-E-E-N-Y-A, because I'm from Charleston. If you're from Charleston, you get it. Uh, same thing on Instagram. I also run uh, uh, an online initiative called Black Food Fridays. 
uh, where we try to encourage everyone to order food from black owned restaurants every Friday. Uh, that's at Black Food Fridays. Uh, so thank you all. I'm going to bring in the ladies from Goodstock. Uh, mm -hmm. Kelly, Ebony, Kim. There we go. All right, Ev, there's Kelly. Uh, is Kim coming through? Oh, boom. There we go. <laughs> We're good to go. Thank y'all, ladies. I'm going to I'm going to be here so we can close this out later, but I'm going to hand the mic off to y'all. Thanks, KJ. I don't know. We ready. ready. I cried like five times. Yeah, listen, I don't get to work with Trey often, so this is this was cute on him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe number three. <laughs> well, guys, this was a really good conversation. We did have some questions from the audience, and the first one was um, a really good one, actually. When are we going to challenge the curriculum that's being taught to our kids? Because Black kids aren't really learning about real Black contributions. Black and white kids, Kim. Black and white kids, mm -hmm, but verbatim mm -hmm. from the question pool. Right. Guys, what do you think? And KJ, we encourage you to be a part of the conversation too. <laughs> great, great question. Great question. Um, I think we all need to start knocking on that door, ask, asking that question now. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think just recently, I think uh, Drew Brees made a comment about um, not being with anyone who stands for the flag. And his wife came out and apologized. And she, she mentioned something about, you know, um, not totally being aware, you know, um, and not having, you know, African-Americans as prevalent in um, the curriculum or in the history books, you know. So she was saying that if some of that was placed in, you know, maybe some of the ignorance would not have been there. But our kids just need to know about their ancestors and, and more of that needs to be published. And also I wanna encourage um, parents and people in the community to, to um, figure out what their students learning style is. Uh, everybody doesn't have the same learning style. So that makes a big difference when it comes to students in the classroom. If you don't know what your learning style is and um, you're sitting in a classroom all day and the teacher's up on the board just writing notes on them, that wasn't me. You know, I'm big on interaction. Uh, I'm an athlete. so. I'm big on just interacting and, 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 and doing things. So when you have me sitting there and reading something that's on the board all day, I'm not going to totally get it, you know? And, yeah. and I have to tell my daughter that now she likes to read to herself and she's kind of stubborn. Um, Wonder where she gets that from. Hold man. on a second. Don't you talk that, about my niece. Get that from. Don't talk about my niece. She yeah. may get it from her dad. <laughs> but a lot of what you're saying is something that I know um, parents of black boys, we talk about often, you know, them needing to have tactile instruction or kinesthetic right. instruction mm -hmm. in order to really grasp information. So, yeah, thank you. Very valuable, very valuable point. Um, I think I if I, other guys, KJ, you're gonna if, if I'm going to answer the question as directly as possible, when are we going to challenge the curriculum? We're going to challenge it when we decide we're ready to challenge it. Um, the, the, the curriculum is set. I mean, I, you can go online right now in every state and find out what the state curriculum is. If the curriculum is not to your liking, then we need to start writing textbooks, right? We need to start writing curriculums. And I can't write curriculum, but there's some brothers and sisters who do know how to do that. And we need to fund them so that they can write the curriculums and we can give it to our state reps, our state education departments, our local school districts, and be like, this is stuff that we want taught. We have to fight for that. So it's going to happen when we decide we're ready to start the challenging process. Absolutely. And again, voting on your school board and constituent school boards, those help. Um, yeah. Evan, I'm going to pass to you for another question. All right. Next question um, says, we grew up in the gap, meaning that our parents were raised during the civil rights movement. And now our children are being raised in a time where social media is showing the lynchings that were happening in the 50s and 60s that our parents were up with, but we didn't see that. So how do you cope with seeing that for one, but how do you think more importantly that this is now gonna shape your kids? We know how it shaped our parents. How do you think it's actually impacting your children? So I think this generation, especially this current group of high schoolers and kids that are actively experiencing um, COVID-19 and the implication of a worldwide pandemic, which hadn't been seen um, since the Spanish flu, um, mm -hmm. is going to shape 
that generation forever. It's going to shape the generation as far as technology is concerned. It's going to shape the generation as far as college education is concerned and how they seek and, 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 and access college education. And I think it's also going to give them a framework to personal interaction with each other. You know, they're talking about social distancing will be around for many, at least months. But now we're going to look at how we interact with each other from a distance and not as warm and connectedness as the Black community has historically been. So using these platforms and becoming socially literate and really creating access for those that don't have the hardware packages, the tablets, the Chromebooks, the laptops, to be able to engage um, through the social media is really what an effort needs to be done because there is a significant portion of Blacks and minorities that don't have the technology access that's important as of today and since March 16th when much of the country went on lockdown. So it's really gonna be important to create that access for technology um, because things are changed. And add on top of it, our actual, probably with Mr. Floyd, that was the first time a significant portion of America saw somebody die on camera. And that trauma and the PTSD associated with that will be a long lasting effect for folks forever. Just to witness somebody actually die on camera mm -hmm. and call for their mother. There are stories of men in the war that would call for their mother when they were in a foxhole. But this man was on American street with a neck being applied to his, with a knee being applied to his neck, calling for his mother. That is trauma and we all witnessed it. Hence the challenges, the uprising, the protests that we see in the community Today. Yeah, I mean, it lights a fire. I mean, if 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 that I mean, we talk about the anger, we talk about the enrage, but if that doesn't motivate you to want to get up an hour early than you used to get up and go to sleep an hour later, grinding to get to the top, I just I don't know what will. I mean, to answer the question, this is a watershed moment. 2020 now is a watershed moment. And you know, I'm gonna tell my, my little girl and the one on the way that listen, this is where you've gotta be great, period. And this should motivate you to continue to be the best that you can be and excel in what, you, in what you're up to and excelling in your field. And speaking of the little one, she didn't come in here impromptu, but, <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's the key. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, that's, that's the key. That's the key, so you know, it's important. Yeah. yeah. Kelly, I'll volley over to you. Aww. Yeah. Very sweet. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'm going to kick this around and want um, our panelists to really, really share their perspectives. But as Black men, how do you stay encouraged and how do you stay hopeful, particularly in this very tumultuous season in which we find ourselves? Uh, I'm going to start with you, Anton. How do you stay hopeful and, and encouraged? Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest, you know, just going back and I guess it really affected me, you know, just the, the Trayvon Martin back then, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, I've been going through the grief and loss process, you know, uh, minus the acceptance part. Um, it's just really just had me on an emotional roller coaster because you, you, you see this and then you hear about it and you see it on tape and you say, man, how can someone get away with murdering somebody and it be captured on video? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and it's, it's really discouraging, you know? So I've had some ups and downs and I've gone through my periods where I've just been mm -hmm. outright, just, just really upset, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but when you see your kids and you know that you have to you have to be there for them and you have to be that that backbone for them you have to be that rock and then the future the other kids so that's my motivation that's what that's what keeps me you know sane and, and what keeps me together when i go out and I'm, I'm able 
you know, to do something for them and I'm able to assist them to, to get better and I'm able to teach them and, and help them to improve their circumstances. That's what keeps me sane and that's what keeps me motivated and hopeful. And then, you know, to, to hear some of, um, of my white peers, you know, and, and see them out trying. Um, <laughs> that yep. that takes that takes some of, of the pain away as well you know because i've had people to reach out and, and in the past i've had no no one to reach out and, and so now I'm, I'm i'm saying man what's the difference this has been going on mm -hmm. um you know uh, black men have, have i mean this is i mean you go all the way back you know um i was watching a series uh with um i think the, the guy's name was uh, uh, uh dominu uh, uh dillo i mean shot 41 times Mm -hmm. 41 times. I mean, and, and, and no conviction. The Trayvon Martin, I mean, they come up with the stand your ground law. I mean, it's really discouraging, you know, for us, but we can't stop. We have to keep pressing on in, in, in order for things to get better, you know. Thank you for that. We got to keep pressing on. KJ, what about you? What keeps you encouraged? What keeps you motivated during this season? Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know how I'm able to keep going. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real. I think it's genetically ingrained in us as black people, especially black people who identify as Gullah Geechee, that we, we, we don't know how to do anything but go forward, right? Like, all we know is persevere and just keep going and keep going. And I think that can sometimes be detrimental, because we don't stop and take emotional stock of where we are you know, emotionally and mentally. And so, you know, our job is just to keep moving and keep pers press pressing forward and persevering. But I, I really don't know how, because there's sometimes I get very angry, you know, like very, and I'm not even an angry type person. Um, but I'm just like, yo, like at some point this got to stop. So I think the thing that propels me forward is the fact that I still have breath in my body. And I still have a lot of good ideas that haven't even been implemented yet. And there's always a chance. As long as we're alive, we have a chance to make things right and turn things around. So I guess maybe that's what it is, just knowing that tomorrow is available. Even though it's not promised, it is available. Thanks for that. Jonathan, what about you, who just had that sweet baby girl on your lap? I have an a inkling of an idea what keeps you motivated. But, but seriously, you know, in this season, what gives you hope? What allows you to press forward? What allows you to move on? Because it's hard out here. Definitely family, just like everyone said on the panel, definitely family is number one, making sure that they grow up and understand that, listen, you're different from the majority. When you go to school, you're going to be different. You're going to be looked at different. Things are going to, people are going to perceive you different. Your goal is to continue to do well at what you do and dispel as much of that as possible and not consciously have an issue if it doesn't work out well, know that you are doing the best that you can and you get to the, the highest ranks and then you help somebody out. I mean, you know, we can't control what we can't control, but what we can control is what we individually do, whether it's business, whether it's our profession, whether it's our family, whether it's giving back financially or our time or whatever, those are the things that we can control. And if we focus on that, then the enemy cannot continue to you know, throw us thoughts that try to either separate us or set us back. You got to mentally focus on what we are doing. Absolutely. Before I kick it back to you, Kim, I'll just say, Anton, you know, your point about folks reaching out to you over the past, you know, couple days and weeks is something that I've experienced. You know, I've had conversations with Kim and Ebony about, y'all, have you ever had this many white people reach out to you? Uh, <laughs> just like expressing their concerns, expressing their sympathy. Like I've just been getting emails and texts and all kinds of things left and right. And at the end of the day, to Nate's point, I think what it comes down to is, is the bottom line of this man was on the ground. This man had a knee on his neck. This man called out to his mama. That fundamentally- His deceased mother. His deceased mama. And that fundamentally humanizes and levels things in a way that I don't think that white America had ever experienced. Mm -hmm. um, we all come from a mama, you know, we all come from a mama. And so to hear this grown man calling out to her for better or for worse, humanize him in a way, 
in which I don't think white America ever really saw black men. And so his life was not in vain and he has truly helped spark the movement. So I'm gonna kick See, it that's to what you, bothers, Kim, for the next That's question. what bothers me right there. That, that bothers me because for one, Trayvon Martin was a child. For two, mm -hmm. Tamir Rice was a child. Um, for three, Martin Luther King was the nation's brother, father, and he was murdered. I mean, so it, it honestly, it bothers me if yet another person has to go through this to die again for now some people to wake up. That's and it, honestly, That's I, and honestly, right. right. And, and it's, it's like, he had a little kid. He has a little daughter. So it should have been a wake up call way back with Emmett Till. It should have been a wake up call years ago. So I'm not I'm not willing to sacrifice. This made me cry. And Todd is my um, brother in law. I'm not willing to sacrifice him for someone else to wake up. So this this has to stop. I don't want a text message. Don't call me and say, "Oh, how are you doing?" I'm not doing good. You know why? I ha I have a father. I have a brother-in-law, I have a, a nephew. Like, so no, keep the text messages. I don't want them. Send a text message to your family members. Send, send a text message to, to your cousin. Send a text message to your pastor to tell him to start talking about it in church. Send a text message to, to your boss. Tell them to start talking about it. You're but with my, with my brother-in-law, Antel was pulled over by a police officer. And maybe Antel, you want to share this as I'm telling your business, but literally told him, let me see your license and don't make me shoot you. For what? And that's the reality that we need to stop tiptoeing around and saying, oh, thank you for this text message. Because I think the text message is bullshit. Don't text me, write a policy. What we know is that 65% of all elected visit, uh, uh, officials are white men. What we know is 90% of all elected positions are held by white people. So don't text me, start writing write out that policy to put your own in jail if they sit there and shoot our men, period. Go ahead, Kim. Absolutely, Ab. We want to see some legs on these text messages. So we yep. get your message. We know you care, but okay. show us that you care. It goes back to my favorite James Baldwin quote, right? I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And mm -hmm. so if you want Black people to really inherently and intrinsically right. believe that you care, show us that you care. Right. In your individual roles, we all have a role to play in change. We have the power to be the change that we want to see. So it is your responsibility to get that done. And it's not Black people's responsibility to teach you how to do it or to give you permission or instruction on how to do it. That's a real aggressive response to this right here. So if you you know what you need to do because you, you know, know what you have the capacity to do and we ask you to just do it because people are hurting. And that honestly segues into our next question that was offered. We so often hear the narrative about black men not um, engaging in counseling or therapy. So what are your thoughts about that panel and how can we encourage um, more Black people and especially Black men um, to release this anger and stress and rage that I know you guys are feeling every day. And if you're not going to therapy, where are you going to discuss these issues? Mm -hmm. oh, so I, um, for many years, I ran fatherhood groups in a, in a local um, pre-release center um, in collaboration with another guy. Um, and group forums are the most effective place for black men to kind of I connect, vent, realize that we're in the same boat, um, come out and see our commonalities and then be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the traditional community resources of those that participate in church, mosque, um, are great places. Um, you know, we acquiesce um, as, as black men and, and share like commonalities in those group type forums. And I think with me being a mental health professional um, and as you're talking, I'm kind of dealing with some crisis stuff right here. Um, the importance of, um, and the impact of PTSD on our psyche. You know, for the longest time when we were treating our children, we gave our black children significant heavy diagnosis. We gave black children as young as seven diagnoses such as bipolar disorder, um, gave children as young as 10, um, psychotic disorder. 
Um, now there's a big movement in the mental health field. And I think Dr. Johnson can, can identify and relate to that. To really look at PTSD as the implication of the impact of a shared experiences and experiences that really warp your thinking and make you think differently. And that is truly PTSD. Um, and not that heavy diagnosis that needs a psychiatric or psycho psychiatric intervention via medication, but really some opportunity to talk it out and normalize it. And that's really important. And I think that, you know, the first teacher, the first counselor, the first, the first, all of those is the mother and the family and important of nurturing and taking care of our families and children while we continue to develop. So I think there is opportunities for maybe not so much traditional therapy for African-American men, but places that we do come together and we relate and we connect um, and, and we are able to share our common experiences um, that we have had in this country. I think counseling to, I, I've been to counseling for my, my own self with issues that I've had in the past Man, counseling to people who don't believe in it, it's, it's expensive, but it's a really good uh, outlet to get your stuff out. And for someone who's not related to you, who's not going to try to fix, who's there just to listen and encourage you and, and maybe give you some other tools that you're totally unaware of to help you cope and to deal with issues that we're going through. Right now, we're going through a really tough time because you never know when your name is going to be the next hashtag. You never know when you're going to be the next hashtag. The other day I left home and I just sat in my truck. I drove down the road and I cried for like 10 minutes because it, it, it's just unbelievable to me that someone can think that they can get away with just killing a man in the middle of the street, middle of the day, and this guy gets the, they, they put the body, because he was dead at the time. They put the body in the back of the ambulance and they go on about their business. It's, it's hard for me to even conceive that. And, and, and it hurts me to my heart. I mean, listen, there's nothing wrong with therapy. Therapy helps you reset. It helps you focus on priorities. And it gives, just like Trey saying, my my good alpha brother, I can see the uh, I can see the brick back there. You know, it's 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 important to reset. It's important to mentally be stable because again, that's the whole point. They want to throw you off mentally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is, images, thoughts, you know, media, whatever. They want to throw you off so that you're not 106% on your game. So there's nothing wrong with therapy. Therapy is great. Just like Nate is saying, group therapy is great. I mean, LeBron has the Calm app now. He's like a part investor in the Calm app. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the Bible, obviously. You know, and sometimes it's just taking five or six seconds when you wake up in the morning with your family to say, you know, God, thank you for everything. And we're going to make it happen today. And that's it. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm for therapy time. as well. Go ahead, Anton. I'm sorry. I'm prepared for this, Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm prepared for this well, but um, um, I I have I've never you know gone to to therapy, but I guess my therapy has been um my friends, and and I also have a a master's degree in mental health counseling, um, so there's some measures that I take you know, um, to assist myself, um, like a, a, a lot of black people for them, therapy is, is, is in the barbershop, you know, for the black males. Uh, we go in the barbershop and, and, and we let loose. We talk about, you know, the different things that go on. I know I have a, a group of buddies that, you know, I'm really close to and, and, and we um, air um, out, you know, our concerns to one another and we're honest with one another uh, about what's going on and what, we need to do and then we let each other know, you know, for different things. If, if we've done something that's wrong, when we share that information, we let one another, hey, bro, you wrong, you know? And uh, so it's, it's just, just having those support groups as well. And then um, one thing that, that, that I didn't mention that I was sitting here thinking about when you're saying, how do you continue to go on is one thing that helps me is I know that God has me, hmm. you know? So I know God got me. So, you know, I, I let whatever happens happen, but I know he has me 
you know, regardless what my fate may be at the end of the day. So, you know, I don't stress on a whole lot. Mm -hmm. All right. And KJ, we'll round this out with you because we are one minute until our hour. So send us on home. Have I gone to therapy before? Yes. It was spectacular. I'm not even going to lie. Uh, it was way better than I thought it would be. But I, I would like to say that there's some there's some real issues that are barriers of entry, right? And one of those issues is cost. Uh, everyone's insurance doesn't take care of therapy. And when I'm going to speak for North Charleston, and you know, the city of North Charleston, Black people, the median average is $21,000 compared to white people being $60,000. Mm -hmm. So when you're making twenty one, twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and your insurance doesn't cover these things, even if you want them, that that cost is prohibitive for you going forward. Outside of that, there's the stigma. You know, it's it's lessening as we get older, um, but there's still a stigma in some black people like, oh, man, you go to the therapist because you're crazy. So we got to get over the, the stigma. We have to be real about the cost prohibitiveness. And then I think last but not least is uh, and this is this is a longer process, but we need more people of color and more black people specifically in these professions so that we can feel comfortable unloading. When I went to therapy, uh, I had a white woman and she did great. I mean, we, we had a great conversation, but I wonder like how much deeper would I have gone if it was a black woman or a black man? Would I have continued going if it was a black person? My brother's therapist is a black woman and he goes all the time, like every Saturday or every other Saturday because you know they have something shared outside of him just relieving his mental stress. That's something to keep in mind as well. But um, yeah, those those are my thoughts. And I hope I answered the question. That was perfect, AJ. That was perfect. I'm going to push it over to Dr. Hilton to wrap us up and give a great summary as we close out for the night. But I just want to say thank you guys. You were phenomenal tonight. Yeah. You know, I don't even know what to even say as far as a um, complete closure. It is one of those things of, um, you know, when you think about I'm very religious too. And we always say the head of the household is the man. And, um, and like I said, I think about my father. I think about you, Anton. I grew up with you. <laughs> Basically, you are my brother. And I just hope you guys know that we pray for y'all all the time. That um, more than anything, when, when the media tries to tell you that you're not good enough, that we think you're absolutely perfect, mm -hmm. that we think that you are strong and brilliant and you're the most talented people. You created things out of absolutely nothing. Um, and so when you hear that echo of Black Lives Matter, we really do mean that you matter, um, that it is individual, it is specific. Um, and we just thank y'all for always standing by us, always being our protectors, always being the things that we can, we can lean back on because we know you always got us. And we hope that you also feel that we have you. So just thank y'all. Absolutely. That was perfect. That was Absolutely. perfect. And perfect. if you guys enjoyed this conversation tonight, don't forget to tune in on Wednesday when we have a follow up to this conversation with a panel of white women. So breaking bread, dear white women, they will have the opportunity. And I know that they tuned in tonight to watch this conversation unfold and to even process and digest what it means and give it back to us so we can start to bridge and understand because we know that there's tension there with Amy Cooper to the socialized Flipana to the woman who was in the gas station. I mean, we could probably go on and on with these women for days. But, for days, but they have been brave enough to come on an open forum to have a conversation about race relations with black men. And so we hope that you tune in Wednesday at six o'clock, same YouTube channel. Kelly. Same YouTube channel. <laughs> so to all of the folks who tuned in today, thank you so much. We appreciate you. You can learn more about Goodstock Consulting and our work at www.goodstockconsulting.com. As Ebony has said, we are deeply grateful to the men who joined us this evening and who shared their perspectives and experiences. As the mother of a six-year-old black boy in America, a six-year-old who still has his baby teeth, a six-year-old who still has an infectious giggle and long eyelashes and is considered cute. In a few years, I know he's gonna to transition to be viewed as a threat in this society. And over the past two weeks, I have shed many a tear over what it means for him to enter into a life 
where he is in danger, where his opportunities are limited, and where he has to overcome obstacles that he should not have to. And so to every mother out there, every black man out there who's watching this, keep the faith, everybody. As Nate said earlier, we are responsible for our collective communities. Keep your communities and your families tight and uplifted, both in proximity and in prayer. The insights that were shared by these powerful black men give me hope for what lies ahead, despite all of the obstacles that we know that we have to overcome. The obstacles that face our nephews, the obstacles that face our sons, our fathers and our brothers. So to everybody, thanks again for joining. Please be safe out there. Keep practicing social distancing, wear the masks folks and stay encouraged. Thank you. Bye, Good night guys. Good night everybody. Peace.